happen. So let's uh, move on to Pam, a different Pam. Uh, Pam, if, what's your question for Dr. Pop? Hi, Pam. Um, Pam Douglas here. I'm 64 also, and I had IBS many, many years ago when I kind of fell apart with my hormones and um, just, you know, some other autoimmune diseases, you know, like thyroid and, and I can go on and on, but um, it's come back. And I had a series of way too many antibiotics over this summer. I, I I had many things and I had to, I had to have antibiotics for, and it was very frustrating. And I know that's ruined my gut. So I'm, I, you know, I've got, I ended up with diverticulitis and I have some polyps in my colon, but they're okay. But it was one thing after the other that I needed to fix. And now it feels like it's back. Maybe it really never was IBS, like you said, but I sure have a lot of those symptoms. Um, so, and I also was, you know, I, I've been under stress because this is, it's horrible to have to deal with this again. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was gone. So maybe those books might help. Um, maybe where can I find that list and any other suggestions you have for me would be great. Okay. Well, I think my, my suggestion um, to you would be to get with somebody who can help you figure out if this is IBS or not. I think the way that you can figure it out is I would tell you to take a, a probiotic uh, for one thing, get a good two strain probiotic and, and take it. Um, I don't know what your diet is like. Um, I don't know if you're still taking drugs and this isn't kind of the place to sort it out. But, but my point is this, that um, it, at some point in time, what you're gonna need to do is get rid of the noise, all right? The low hanging fruit here is if you have a lot of antibiotics that causes gut problems in people who don't have IBS or anything else wrong with their gut. So I would say there's a high likelihood if you haven't had problems for a long time and this started after the antibiotics. Um, it, it, I mean, in the absence of other information, I would say that's the low hanging fruit. Probiotics would be the thing to do next. Thanks, Dr. Popper. Up next, we have David A. Hi, David A. Hi, Dr. Popper. I had a question regarding probiotics. Mm -hmm. I used to take probiotics all the time because many health um, quote unquote experts recommended it. But then I uh, talked to Dr. Zach Bush and he said that there was a study that was done that suggested that probiotics weren't as good as they always thought it was because people who took antibiotics then took, compared people who took probiotics and didn't and people who didn't recovered more than those who did. And he suggested fermented foods were better or just going into a park and getting probiotics that way. Um, so I just wanted to get your thoughts on that. Well, there's a study for everything. There are studies showing that eating chocolate helps you lose weight. And there are studies showing that jumping over down and standing on your head will relieve headaches. I mean, the, the problem is there's a study for everything. And so um, I'm not very influenced by single studies. I'm influenced by analyses of the evidence till you get to a place where you can represent the preponderance of the evidence, all right? So fermented foods, uh, we have a, an hour lecture just on fermented foods. They are not probiotics and they are not substitutes for probiotics. So let's talk about the relationship between the bacteria in your gut and your body, all right? So, so at some point in time, creatures started living inside of other creatures like bacteria in your gut. And, uh, but these bacteria are capable of living on their own, but they take up residence. At some point in time, they took up residence in all creatures. I mean, fruit flies have a microbiome. It's just smaller than humans, right? So these creatures took up residence in, in human bodies in this case. And it appears that an arrangement was made and it went something like this, all right? Um, the gut bacteria can live in my body for free. I won't charge rent. You get to see the world on me and I'll provide the food, all right? In return for that, these critters perform all kinds of functions for us. They have a great deal of influence on our mental health. They have a lot of influence on our gastrointestinal health, our inflammation levels. Um, in fact, uh, they affect cardiovascular health. There's not a, a we, we have 3,500 hours of programming on disease specific, everything from HIV, AIDS to you know, everything, right? And there isn't a single workshop or a series of classes we do that doesn't involve some discussion of the microbiome. It's involved in everything. 
So obviously humans have screwed up because when we say we're going to provide the food, it, it, we weren't really, we shouldn't have promised cupcakes and brownies because that's really not good food for the guy. For all that they do for us, that's not the right food for them. But here's what I'm getting at. Your body doesn't make these bacteria. That's not how they got there in the first place. And how you got them is coming through the birth canal when you were born. The, the bacterial content of the, of the vagina increases during the last, through the birth canal, increases during the last three weeks of, of pregnancy. So you got it that way because you inhaled a lot, got a lot of stuff in your mouth as you were coming through the birth canal and then through breastfeeding, okay? That's how they got there in the first place. So if they're gone to suggest that you're gonna go walk in the park and you're gonna replace these bacteria, that's ridiculous. Are you gonna eat fermented foods? The bacteria eat what you feed them. If there are no bacteria there, there's, you're not feeding anything. And what happens is, and the reason why, why this makes people sick after they've taken antibiotics and all this sort of thing, is the, the antibiotics wipe out everything, but the pathogens are the most likely to survive. They're much stronger than the other guys. And so you're gonna have to actually take oral probiotics or have a fecal transplant, one or the other, but there is no possible way that I can sit here in this room or go outside and sit in the grass and somehow these critters are gonna end up inside of me and take up housekeeping. Furthermore, we know that there are a couple of strains that, that are predominant in say a seven day old baby. And, and if you don't get enough of those two strains, you're simply not gonna be able to, to populate your gut. So anyway, I, I have a little bit different perspective on it based on that. Thanks, Dr. Popper. Up next, we have Benny. Benny, what's your question for Dr. Popper? Hi, Dr. Popper. Thank you for a great uh, lecture as always. Um, is there any correlation between breastfeeding or high dairy in childhood and does fasting or bowel cleansing improve? Well, if it's IBS, none of, first of all, breastfeeding is always better. And you have a whole host of things that are less likely to go wrong if a child's breastfed. Um, bowel cleansing is generally a bad idea um, we, it, by, because you wash out all the bacteria. In other words, you can be a perfectly healthy person. People buy these herbal kits and they don't realize it's got harsh uh, like black walnut, clean everything out, including the, including the good bacteria. We've had a fair number of people over the years who've shown up here after doing that kind of stuff. And, he said, I felt better for a while and then I got really feeling terrible. And the reason is because they got rid of all their gut bacteria. So I don't think that's the answer to it. Um, I think the bottom line, I'll just come back to this, which is that um, IBS has, is a condition that involves physical symptoms that are driven by a psychological state. And if a physical cure, if a physical change results in a cure, quote unquote, then it wasn't IBS in the first place because without the psychological treatment, it just doesn't go away. 